Great. Uh, I'll just and start. Uh, so, yeah, today's lecture is uh, scaling Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies for the masses. Uh, how we can actually, what are the challenges with getting Bitcoin to actually scale and reach like its original goal, which was to become a worldwide monetary exchange system. Uh, before we start, just one quick thing that, I don't know, it won't affect too many of you, but those of you who are interested in joining Bitcoin Association of Berkeley after you finish this decal, uh, Bitcoin Association of Berkeley doesn't exist anymore. Uh, we rebranded ourselves to Blockchain at Berkeley. Uh, it's just like a, it's like a small difference, but it's kind of a big like administrative difference that we're trying to do. Uh, so this decal is currently like run by Bitcoin Association. It's now gonna be being run under the education department of Blockchain at Berkeley. Uh, Blockchain at Berkeley will also be having a consulting department, which we've been like hyping up for a little while now, as well as like an innovation, which is more like research projects, um, just talks, networking, stuff like that. So um, if any of you are interested in joining Blockchain at Berkeley next semester, uh, please let us know because we have some really interesting stuff going on. Yeah. What do you do? Hmm? What, what is so Blockchain at Berkeley, our goal is to become the hub of blockchain in the Bay Area. Um, right now, like in a lot of technology fields, Silicon Valley and Bay Area is obviously the hub. But in blockchain, I feel the real like big development is happening a lot in Europe. And we're trying to like bring that here to the Bay Area, which you just don't have that here. You have a lot of startups working on blockchain here, but you don't really have this like centralized place where like people come together and like ed talk not just like work like trying to make money off it but also like education research things like that um and part of the name change was just like even like just in this decal itself like half the time we talk about bitcoin but the other half is like i don't know ethereum hyperledger private blockchains so we've become so much more than just bitcoin so that's a bit of the reasoning behind that anyways okay Back to the lecture, scaling Bitcoin. Um, so this is just a kind of a tangent, but I just want to, uh, it kind of relates back to like the whole uh, community uh, lecture that we had like two weeks ago. And I was just like doing research for this lecture and I found this and I thought it was really funny about how this guy, there's a, like, there's a lot of conspiracy theories when it comes to Bitcoin. And this guy claims that uh, Bitcoin Core, it, their goal is to like cripple Bitcoin and the, and then basically force everyone to use Lightning Network, which we're going to explain in this lecture. Um, it's, this is all like really conspiracy theory kind of stuff, but I just thought it was funny and had a good relation to the last lecture. Anyways, okay. So uh, today's the outline is basically when we talk about what is the scalability problem, what is the block size debate, and what are other proposed scalability solutions. Can you see this? Okay. Um, so what is scalability? The biggest thing that scalability traditionally refers to is how many transactions per second you can do. Like, um, it has a maximum velocity of transactions. Another thing that we should think about scalability, it's not what is the main concern, but also just how big the blockchain is. That's another thing we should be thinking about when we're talking about scalability. Right now it's already at 80 gigabytes big, uh, which is more than any uh, mobile wallet can handle. Um, also, like, it could fit on my laptop, but I don't really want to, like, give up 80 gigabytes on my laptop to hold the entire blockchain. So, if we're trying to increase scalability, we also have to keep uh, storage size in mind. But, back to transaction volume. So, this is the rough size of transactions over time. So, it's been roughly, for the past few years, rough, uh, months, roughly consistent. Uh, but the big number we want to keep in mind is the average size, which is 546.38. And using this, we can figure out what our maximum transaction volume is. So if we have an average size of 546 bytes per transaction, there's only one megabyte uh, in our block size, and every expected time for block is 10 minutes. So we can just easily calculate what's the maximum transaction volume per second, and the Bitcoin network at its maximum can currently handle 3.2 transactions per second, which is like, okay, that's not bad, until we consider this. PayPal on average handles 150 transactions per second, and its peak handles 450 transactions per second, 
Well, Visa, on average, uh, handles 2,000, but at its peak, handles 56,000. So Bitcoin is nowhere close to like even matching these other payment systems. So what we're trying to figure out is how can we solve this? So going back to this uh, model, so we look at like what are our free variables that we can play with. We can have we can play with either the size of the blocks, uh, we can play with the size of transactions, or we can play with the block creation rate, how often blocks are created. Um, so the naive solution is the easiest thing that we can do is just create blocks faster. It's not really that big of a deal. We just have to get everyone to come to consensus and say, okay, let's all just produce blocks uh, faster, and that way we don't really have to do that many major changes to the Bitcoin uh, system. So um, I want to try to make this lecture a bit more interactive uh, because we've had so we've gone over a lot of stuff in Bitcoin, a lot of the technical side. So I want to see if anybody can figure out like what are the cons of doing this. Like there are some very immediate reasons why this just doesn't work. So yeah, why is it less secure though? Because the nonce is mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. easier to find a solution. So yeah, um, it's Boop. like it's like more likely for a attacker to be able to yeah solve one block. Exactly. Yeah. So it's easier for a higher someone with more hash power to find blocks faster, which makes a longer chain. Uh, and it also it basically increases the chance of orphan blocks more. It's more likely for people to find the same block at the same time. So yeah. Get a clarification. So is that reducing the same thing as reducing the difficulty you're saying? Yes, that's the same thing as reducing the difficulty. Because it'll take less time for someone to find a solution. Why is it a larger block easier to find a solution for? It's not a larger block. All it this is what this is suggesting is we reduce the difficulty. I that. Oh, sorry, no problem. Um, any other cons? Yeah. I guess you you have to wait for more blocks. Yeah, that's the other way. If you like, it seems you, like the same amount of time. Though. Yeah, so you could have a pro that like, if you're the kind of person who doesn't wait for full confirmations, like you only wait for one confirmation, it's good because like, now you have to wait less time for one confirmation. But if you want the same level of security that you do now, instead of waiting for six confirmations, now you just have to wait for twelve. So it doesn't really help in that way. You're right. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. have like more um, dissonance and like agreement, on, like, like, in terms of like transactions getting into a block like because there's more time for like for everyone to be broadcasting their transactions so like, yeah so that's a so then more fragmentation yeah like, so that's another big issue uh, it takes time for the uh, the whoever finds a block <coughs> it takes time for them to propagate the solution across the network is that what you're referring to well, I was talking about the transactions but I guess yeah, okay like, well yeah right. it takes time for people to propagate their transactions across the network so less propagation time this could be an issue um, and I can, I'll explain in a later one why this less propagation time is an issue. Um, more block orphaning, which is what you said. Um, you mess up having, which is like the block size, uh, the block reward is supposed to have every certain number of transactions, which is supposed to be roughly every two years. Um, it's not really a legitimate concern, but it is something that will just take a little bit of tweak. You can like do something called double having. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, more frequent forks, like you said, that kind of has to do with the more block orphaning. That makes it easier to double spend. And it's um, less likely to be accepted than increasing the block size. Because increasing the block size is a very like small change. Well, this is a very fundamental shift to like of the um, like protocol. You have to it's a lot more change required than just doubling the block size. Um, ironically though. Vitalik Buterin, who is the creator of Ethereum, proposed exactly that, and he was just basically completely ignored by the community. Um, it was kind of, um, it's more of a purely academic reason, and it was more of just like a protest against segregated witness, where he was just saying like, Bitcoin Core is, like we mentioned, really against hard forks, and he was just like pointing out like how silly that is by creating this really convoluted solution uh, using a soft fork, and uh, basically how it works is just basically all, you, if you can just get all miners to agree to lie to the system and claim false timestamps that are like, and that you say that, oh, I solved this block in 10 minutes, but you actually do it in two minutes. And I'm not really fully sure of how it works, but basically you can trick the system into keep doing that. And basically it'll just keep reducing the difficulty until the point that it is gonna be able to be solved in two minutes. 
but every time someone solves it in two minutes, you actually just lie to the system and say you solve it in 10 minutes, so it keeps the difficulty the same. Uh, that way, it'll require no change in code. Um, obviously, this is a really silly, absurd idea, but it's, like I said, it's just a poking fun at the necessity to use soft forks over hard forks. Um, also, but also, like, do consider that Ethereum does have 17 second block times, which is like, and it's been working, kind of. Obviously, Ethereum hasn't hit the scale that uh, Bitcoin has, but uh, uh, Vitalik has like an awesome like link, um, just explaining pros and cons. I don't want to get too much into that because that's not the main point of this lecture. But uh, if you want, if you're interested in that, I thought that was really interesting. Uh, it's linked to on the slide, so you can go check it out. Um, so yeah, these are the actual like proposed solutions to scalability. There's a block size capacity increase, segregated witness, side chains, and lightning network. Um, blockchain block capacity size. This is we've talked a bit about it in our um, uh, community and lecture, but uh, just a basic idea is one. I just want to bring up that this was actually Satoshi's original solution in his in his like original uh, forum post. He said, like, it can be phased in, like, just after a certain block number, you just change the larger limit. So that's, like, one thing. I saw. I just saw this on the Bitcoin Unlimited website. They're like, guys, this was the original solution, so we should use it. But, um, so obviously the pros of it is it's a very easy solution, as we saw here. It's, like, not that big of a deal to change. Um, we just have to get, like, all miners to agree, which, as we know from Unity, it's not that easy of a solution, but... Um, we might have to do it for Lightning Network anyways, because it's considered maybe Lightning Network needs larger blocks to function properly. And it does lessen transaction fee fees, which is good if you're a user. So now, can anyone figure out what the cons are of this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, size of the blockchain may increase. That's a huge one. It's a hard fork. Mm -hmm. It is a hard fork, yeah. Uh, yeah. Isn't there less mm -hmm. miners as well? Yeah. Uh, so lesser lesser transaction fees if you're a miner. So that's bad for you. Mm, anybody else? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hard fork. Blah blah blah. I don't really care about that. Um, I kind of. I, I know I do. I know Max does. Like we don't really care. I, uh, hard forks I think are more necessary. Uh, are necessary. It's kind of silly to just continuously use soft forks to solve fundamental problems. So, but yes, that's a major issue. Uh, the bigger thing is lesser transaction fees if you're a miner. The size increases very fast, and this is a slippery slope, uh, because you can just keep doubling every time you, every, you, every time it starts getting fill up. You just say, oh, let's just double it again, and double it again, and this can go on forever. Uh, Vitalik, in his like uh, speed argument, says, oh, this is a better solution than doubling, because it um, doesn't have a slippery slope, because there is a like fundamental uh, limit to how short uh, block times you can do. So he's like, that's a, that once again, that was just kind of a poke at fun at this. But um, also, longer propagation time. So what happens here is larger blocks take more time to propagate and are lo take longer to validate. And so what happens is that other miners can take longer to validate a uh, block and they can't start mining a new block until they validated the old block and what this does is it gives more time for the person who created this block they have more time to start working on the next one because they can start working on it right away while everyone else is still validating and if it takes longer for everyone else to validate it's more likely that they win the next block award as well and it kind of just starts <coughs> building up um, and finally it's a one-time linear capacity increase. So basically, it's just like, sure, we have um, 3.2. If we double it, great. We hit like 6.4 transactions per second. That's still like nothing compared to what like Visa has. So that's <coughs> really not a long-term solution. It's kind of like a temporary fix. Sorry, I have a question. Mm -hmm. The larger block size, it takes, doesn't take, does it take longer to solve it? Um, no, it doesn't take longer to solve it, I don't believe so, because you can just reduce the nonce and stuff in order to make that fine. The issue is just more it takes longer to validate. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, so yeah, some examples of this that I mentioned last time were Bitcoin Classic, which wants to double it to 2, Bitcoin XT, which wants to double it to 8. Uh, the more interesting one that's actually, I think it's kind of 
interesting. It's called Bitcoin Unlimited, which allows, I mentioned it earlier, but basically it allows miners to, it basically creates a market for um, like the block size, which allows miners to accept a block larger than their own maximum accepted block size. Um, and basically it will make block size like uh, defined by the supply and demand of like a transaction fee market. And this sort of, like you could consider the block size like the central point of control of the Bitcoin economy and uh, basically the theory is that like free market economics will like, force it to hit like a consensus of like what the block size should be and will allow it to adapt in real time. So if suddenly there's a high volume of transactions and the block size will increase. So uh, an update on via BTC. So two weeks ago when I talked about how via BTC was like trying to for stop it from happening and they controlled more than 5% of the mining hash power. Uh, half their like miners just ditched them and they're like you guys are holding up segregated witness They just left via BTC and segregated witness passed and it's in now the code I don't think it's been activated yet, but it's in the code just waiting to be activated All right, uh, speaking of that segregated witness so segregated witness basically takes up a um, Each transaction the signature takes up a decent amount of space in each block and there's really no reason it needs to be there because you only need it to verify, but after you're done with that, you don't need it anymore. So what the idea is we can remove the uh, signatures from the uh, main block and put them in something else, a separate area called segregated witness. And basically these new nodes will see the script pub keys and know to look at the segregated witness. Um, but what happens to old nodes that don't, haven't been updated, they're basically gonna see these new uh, keys, and uh, I can't really see because it's really bright right now, but basically they're gonna, all that, what the script pub key here is gonna say is let anyone spend this transaction. And they're gonna be like, this is crazy, but it doesn't really matter to us, so we're gonna approve it anyways. And, um, so it's going to be kind of insecure, but at the same time, old nodes wouldn't really care. And um, basically, uh, they're going to approve it, and then real people running newer nodes will actually know what to do with the uh, segregated witness. Um, yeah, so that's basically why segregated witness w is a soft fork, because these old nodes running old code can still accept and verify it even though the verification is wrong. Um, so one issue with that though is that old nodes don't, can't spend transactions until they, that like circular witness transaction until they update their code. Um, so yeah, how that works is, oh, so, but one issue is that the blockchain should serve as a, like a proof that like signatures were included uh, in this and it's just so like, for historical purposes, you can go back and check were these all these transactions on the blockchain actually real. Uh, so basically what you do is the segregated witness miner will create a separate Merkle tree out of the segregated witnesses that perfectly matches the like structure of the main transaction tree. Uh, and then this tree's Merkle root is included as the input field of the Coinbase transaction. The Coinbase transaction was the uh, transaction that like the miner gives himself. Um, and basically what this does is it changes the transaction ID of the Coinbase transaction and therefore signatures can influence the block header and ultimately the makeup of the blockchain. So that way if somebody did want to really store all the segregated witness trees, they can go back and say, they can go ahead and do this and say like, look, oh, I do have the Merkle root and it, do it, was, it matches the one that's in the blockchain. Uh, people are like, this is kind of silly because this is not what the Coinbase transaction was meant to do. It's kind of this really hacky and it's like, we're, we're just like trying to put things in where it needs to be. And this is like all really, really convoluted ways to avoid a hard fork. So yeah, and it causes really messy code. Um, so yeah, uh, some of the pros of it are it's only a soft fork. Um, it fixes something called transaction malleability. Uh, which is ne completely necessary for like Lightning Network and sidechains to work, but it's not the only way to fix transaction malleability. It's kind of just, fixing transaction malleability is kind of like a side effect of this. There are many other ways to fix transaction malleability. Um, there's no slippery slope, 
because unlike doubling block size, which you can just keep doing continuously, you can only do this once. You can only like cut it in half once, and it's over. It's, uh, you can't really take out anything else from transactions. Uh, there's a few efficiency gains. Uh, there's a link somewhere on the slideshow where you can go read why, uh, how it like makes verifications faster and stuff. Um, also, a smaller size of the blockchain. So instead, of, uh, it, the blockchain will increase at a slower rate, which is good. Uh, some cons is once again it's a one-time linear capacity increase. So great, we got it up to 4.6. That doesn't, or yeah, 6.4. That doesn't really help too much. Uh, there's a new kind of DDoS attack that you can do called Go Fish with dots. Uh, if you want to like ask me about it, I have like a, a little write-up about how it works. Um, it's very complicated and ugly. It like like I said, it it uses parts of the blockchain that weren't designed to be used for it. Just and it's really messy. It changes over 500 lines of code. Uh, people are very scared that once it's activated, things will go wrong. Um, I don't know. You just have to wait to see that. Like I said, there's other ways to solve malleability. And oh, also, like I said, if you want to be able to spend transactions that were created with segregated witness, uh, wallets have to support it. So. Uh, you, if you get like transactions like that, you kind of have to update your wallet. So that means all the wallet software out there has to uh, redo their code. Um, something similar to segregated witness is something called Schnorr multi-signatures. Uh, basically, instead of requiring signature in a multi-signature where you need the signature of every single like cosigner, it kind of combines them into one signature and uses that. Uh, this can be implemented with either a soft fork or a hard fork. The soft fork is kind of dirt messier, which it, soft forks tend to be, but uh, it can be done. Uh, Multi-signature transactions will be significantly smaller. Uh, it also gives faster verification for multi-signature transactions. Uh, also, it does plausible deniability for participants. So if you have like a, for example, um, three of five uh, multi-signature, all you don't know is that three of the people did do it. You can't actually say which three of them agreed to spend money, which is kind of a beneficial thing, I guess, if you're all about that privatization. And why hasn't it been implemented? Uh, purely just because when Bitcoin first came out, the ECDSA, which is what's currently being used, was the most popular in industry, just because Schnorr was still under patent protection, which it's not anymore. And there's really no cons to using it. Just no one's implemented it yet. So if anyone wants extra credit, just go ahead and spend this weekend. CalHack's just like writing this into the Bitcoin core. <laughs> so back to this. What are the variables that we can play with? Size of block, size of transaction, block creation rate. And what we've seen is all of these, we can only give it like a pretty small multiplier with like big si uh, size of transactions. We can like make it about half using segregated witness. Block creation rate is not something we should really be messing with. Size of blocks, I mean, even if like the highest proposal, which is like Bitcoin XT, it's just like eight times. So that literally only brings us up to about 24 transactions per second. None of this is hitting what we want to do with, uh, if we want to match like something like Visa. So what's the solution? Uh, we need to change something else, we need to be creative. Let's just not use the blockchain. Let's like figure out how to not require all transactions to go through the blockchain. So we can't work on Bitcoin. We have to work one layer above Bitcoin. Um, so one solution to this is called sidechains. Sidechains are basically a way to like, this is a, from a code from the Bitcoin core developer. And basically he, what he imagines is like an internet of chains. You have many different chains running at once. Uh, you can have, so like right now, for example, a lot of people use like the Bitcoin blockchain for the purposes of uh, like authentication. I think I've mentioned, like I, I've met a startup at TechCrunch Disrupt last year that was using like uh, the Bitcoin blockchain for like notarization of documents. Uh, so using sidechains, you can like not fill up the Bitcoin blockchain with like this kind of stuff, but still like depend on the security and stability of the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, ChainDB is another big one that like uses sidechains. So this is what he mad imagines as like an internet of uh, chains where like you have a lot of things that are like pegged to the main Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and what the benefit of this really is, is 
you can like move on. how this helps there's a lot of benefits to this like a lot of altcoins use this and as we mentioned but the scalability benefit of this is you can have a specific side chain that's designed for not non-important transactions like buying your morning cup of coffee uh because buying your morning cup of coffee you probably don't care about like getting six transactions for example and because you don't care about that if you move all these transactions onto a side chain you can in fact actually like increase uh, block time or sorry, decrease block time because like if you like it, you can move it down to like maybe like 30 seconds per block time uh, and per block and it's like less secure but like do you really care as long because all you're using it for buying a coffee and like if this chain is only being used for these small transactions, but it's still pegged to the Bitcoin blockchain for like security. Um, obviously, the pros <coughs> is like what I just said. The con is it's not really a solution because you just move things to a different chain. Uh, you still have the same transaction, like the same number of things going on it. Uh, you st and you still have to have like miners like working on these side chains in order to like uphold these side chains. But it is a step forward. So now on to like what's commonly considered the like true uh, solution to all this uh, is called Lightning Network, which is what Philip will talk about. Yeah, so as Sunny mentioned, we can't really get to any sort of global scalability by just modifying and tweaking like block size or block rate. We have to think of some way where we can make transactions at a high rate without having to have all of them actually serialized and you know made concrete on the blockchain. And so that's kind of like at an essence what like the Lightning Network does. Uh, before I actually go in and go in how like to describe how the Lightning Network works, we're gonna kind of build up into it uh, to get kind of an, an intuitive understanding for what makes up the Lightning Network and then how it works. So if we recall how a Bitcoin transaction works, uh, say Alice wants to pay Bob one Bitcoin. You know, Alice creates like a, a transaction. It's like a chunk of data. In that transaction, she says, okay, from my previous output, um, send Bob one Bitcoin. Uh, then what she does is she signs the transaction. She broadcasts that transaction block, that transactions are not blocked, but like data to the network that transaction gets included in a block, and then Bob you know, waits for some number of confirmations before he considers that transaction to be valid. Um, and you can see there's a lot of like extra junk, basically. Uh, they have to like wait for this whole giant network to decide uh, that Alice sent one Bitcoin to Bob. Um, but maybe, maybe there's some way that we can you know, have Alice and Bob just like locally uh, keep track of their own balances and only when they want to like settle up do they actually hit the actual blockchain. Um, right, so uh, Alice and Bob want some way to be able to make payments between themselves without always having to you know, hit the blockchain, which is really expensive. So we kind of like hypothesize uh, this you know, sort of balance sheet type construction. Um, kind of what we're thinking is like, you know, Alice and Bob have a balance sheet. And, you know, on that balance sheet, it says, like, Alice has 10 Bitcoin, Bob has 5 Bitcoin. Uh, between the two of them, Alice is like, yo, Bob, here's 2 Bitcoin. And all they do is just update the balance sheet. Uh, they don't, you know, talk to anyone else. They just do this locally. Um, now, the key thing is that, you know, obviously, what if, you know, Alice is lying or, you know, she tries to somehow like submit the old balance sheet uh, after she says, your bot, here's two Bitcoin. So what we want to do is kind of build off of this like balance sheet idea into something that's actually secure and something that works when Alice and Bob don't trust each other. So, you know, we have this like blockchain. Um, kind of what we're thinking of is Alice and Bob like open this, you know, secure balance sheet contract, basically. Um, you know, it starts off with some like initial amounts. Uh, over time, Alice and Bob are making lots of transactions, like updating the balance sheet over and over and over. Um, and then at some point later, uh, Alice and Bob want to like settle up and get this like 
money that they, they've exchanged in private uh, settled onto the blockchain itself so that other people can see like, oh, Alice now only has three Bitcoin. So kind of the idea is, is there some way that we can use like Bitcoin script to make this sort of balance sheet style contract? Um, while also making sure that Alice and Bob can't cheat each other, and they also uh, maintain the sort of like local uh, transaction flexibility, that so they don't have to keep like hitting the blockchain. And it turns out this is actually possible. Uh, we call this uh, people have created these. These are called payment channels. Um, but yeah, how does how does this like payment channel thing work? Um, well, so. What these payment channels are called in their full name are hash time locked bidirectional payment channels. <coughs> and so it's a lot of words. Um, their acronym is HTLC, which you'll probably see if you read like the Lightning Network paper. Um, basically, uh, the hash time locked refers to a certain part of the payment channel contract, which only executes uh, either uh, with a hash, the right hash preimage or uh, a certain amount of time or blocks has passed. And we'll see how, where that comes into play in a second. So before we get to the actual construction, um, let's go over some like, quick notation. Uh, in this example, Alice is spending a 10 Bitcoin output here, uh, where she sends three Bitcoin to Bob, and like as change, seven Bitcoin back to herself. So you can see here, Alice got 10 Bitcoin from someone. Um, and this little like down arrow thingy is like saying this is the output and this is the input. And so in order to spend this output, uh, basically how a usual Bitcoin transaction works is you need like a signature. Alice needs a signature in order to spend it, which she does. So here she signs that output, and that goes into the next transaction, <coughs> which sends money to Bob's like address for three Bitcoin and uh, send Bitcoin to Alice's address. Uh, so hopefully that kind of makes sense, because you'll be seeing a lot of them. So how do these HTLCs work, these hash time lock uh, contracts? Well, before we actually get into the time lock contract, uh, or these, the, this payment channel needs to be like initialized. Um, so basically what they do is Alice and Bob cooperate to make this two of two multi-sig uh, address. And you know, two of two multi-sig means that both Alice and Bob have to sign uh, the output in order to spend the money. So Alice and Bob say submit like they send five Bitcoin each into this two of two multi-sig address, which now contains 10 Bitcoin. In order to spend money out of this address, uh, both Alice and Bob have to sign. So you know, if Alice and Bob say like cooperate and say, okay, I want we want our money back immediately, they can just, you know. Say, okay, if both of them agree, they can say sure. They both sign, you know, another transaction that spends five money out to Alice and Bob, and everything's fine. Um, one of the other key step uh, is that Alice and Bob also separately um, randomly sample like two secret values. And they hold these secret values, you know, secret. So Alice doesn't know Bob's secret, Bob doesn't know Alice's secret. Uh, and they exchange their hash values of the secrets. And we'll see why that's useful in a second. Just something to keep in mind. Uh, so the first thing that happens is Alice creates what's called a commitment transaction. So this is kind of like complicated. I'm going to go through it really slowly so we can kind of grok it. Uh, so this is the 2 of 2 multisig uh, transaction output they, they just sent money into. Um, and now Alice, what Alice does is she creates this transaction locally, but she doesn't broadcast it to the network. Now this transaction is special. Uh, basically what it does is it's saying, okay, we're going to take this money out of our like uh, mutual 202 address. I'm going to sign this, which means that uh, as soon as Bob gets a hold of this transaction, he can broadcast it whenever he wants. Um, but he's not going to do that yet. Uh, basically, one of the outputs is saying, immediately give Alice five Bitcoin back. 
So if Bob decides to broadcast this transaction, Alice automatically gets her money back. And the second output is uh, kind of complicated. Basically, it sends five Bitcoin to either Alice or Bob. And the first prerequisite, which sends money to Alice, only sends money to Alice if she signs it and she knows Bob's secret. Uh, we'll see why this is useful, but basically what, it, what it's doing is saying that if Bob cheats, um, Alice can basically get all of the money in the channel. Uh, and the second, second condition is saying that if Bob wants his five Bitcoin back, he has to wait, in this case, 10,000 blocks, for example. Um, so basically, uh, Alice is kind of creating this transaction. She already signs it. She gives it to Bob. Bob's kind of holding on to it um, in case he wants to, uh, or basically holding it as like collateral in case Alice is cheating. Um, yeah? Which one goes to which? Uh, oh, sorry. This is this is like one single transaction. Yeah, but Alice? the last one. Oh, this one? Oh, sorry. It's kind of not clear, but uh, this one goes to Alice. This one goes to Bob. Um, so yeah, you can kind of see if if uh, Bob broadcasts, Alice immediately gets five Bitcoin. And if Alice knows Bob's secret, she also gets the other five Bitcoin in the original output or the original two of two. Um, now, Bob actually does more or less the same thing, kind of like a, a mirrored uh, transaction, but with like, the outputs flipped. So here we see this spending from Alice and Bob, this like two of two address. Uh, Bob signed it, so Alice can broadcast it at any time. And it immediately sends, you know, if it gets put on the network, immediately sends Bob five Bitcoin. And it, says, it sends Bob the other five Bitcoin if he knows Alice's secret. And Alice can only get her money back if she, has, if she waits like 1,000 blocks. So this is pretty complicated, but um, we're going to say now that Alice wants to send Bob <coughs> one Bitcoin. And they're, and they're kind of spending this Bitcoin uh, just, between the, <clears throat> just between the two of them. Uh, so like this, this updated channel contract never actually hits the blockchain. Um, so what they, do, what they do is Alice creates another one of these transactions, except now she just updates Alice's like output amount to four Bitcoin and the rest to six Bitcoin. Um, with one key difference, Alice and Bob generate two new secret values. And this one, this, this transaction output only spends if Alice signed and, and she knows Bob's like second secret, basically. Um, and then Bob does the same thing. Or just, just, to, just to recall, she sends this to Alice. Sorry, Alice sends this to Bob after signing it, which means that Bob can broadcast it at any time. In which case, Alice gets her, her four Bitcoin back now. And Bob does the same thing. He basically follows the same procedure, except this one says, <coughs> uh, send it out to Bob. Send Bob six Bitcoin, and you know Bob can spend it, uh, spend the other four Bitcoin if he knows Alice's secret. So now here's like the the crux of this algorithm, this update step, is that Alice and Bob exchange the first two secrets that they send. So now if we look at, for example, um, you know the case where Alice tries to cheat Bob. So if you remember, you know, they started this, this payment contract, each with five Bitcoin. After the update, Alice now has four Bitcoin, and Bob has six Bitcoin in this like transaction contract thing. So you know, Alice is now down a Bitcoin. What if she wants to cheat Bob and get that Bitcoin back? What she could do is take her uh, original contract, her original transaction that was signed by Bob, <coughs> sign it, and then broadcast it to the network. This means that Bob gets his five Bitcoin back. And in order for Alice to get her uh, five Bitcoin, which is basically one like illicit Bitcoin, uh, she has to wait for 1,000 blocks. But the key part here is that Alice and Bob exchanged their secret values when they updated, which means that 
Bob now sees this like cheat transaction on the blockchain, and he's like, oh, well I know Alice's secret now, so I can just sign this and get all the money. <coughs> so basically, this prevents uh, Alice from cheating Bob because if she tries to cheat him, the only way in which she gets her money back to the original amount that she put in is if you know Bob is like gone for like a week. And in which case she, she waits the 1,000 blocks and can spend the output. So in the case where both parties are you know, cooperating, everything's fine. And if one party tries to cheat, the other party can like override that and just take all the money. And so in the case where, uh, you know, suppose they've got like, they've sent a bunch of transactions, they want to settle their uh, balance now. Basically what they do is they just cooperate and spend money out of the original like two of two multi-sig transaction. So you know, Alice or Bob, you know, creates this like output transaction, sends it the other one, the other one signs it if it's good, they broadcast it and you know, everything's settled. And the key part is that this whole like exchange, which could have like covered, you know, thousands or millions of like, uh, in like transactions between the two, is only ever reflected as two transactions on the blockchain. So, you know, in theory, if you had a, a payment channel set up between two parties that are doing like millions of micropayments, they can do millions of micropayments and only ever have to like pay for basically two blockchain payments. And they get the security and you know distributed, decentralized, whatever, of the underlying blockchain. So that, that's pretty cool, um, but you know, you might, uh, yeah, really quick, yeah, so if Alice and Bob always cooperate, they only, they only ever touch the blockchain uh, like twice, which is pretty good. Uh, and also key is that this contract system, this construction, uh, is built in such a way that Alice and Bob don't have to trust each other, because if one tries to cheat, the other can like override it and just like take all the money. So you might see some issues with just having like a payment channel. Uh, so both Alice and Bob have to keep a bunch of capital locked up in these HDLCs. Um, also, if you only have one payment channel between you know you and another person, you can only make like lots of transactions between you and that other person. And presumably, you make transactions with a lot more than like just one person. Um, and another issue is that. Uh, it's not always feasible to like just make a payment channel with you know every single person you want to make transactions with, because if you think of like a case where you know you're shopping on Amazon, like you don't you don't want to have to make a payment channel with every Amazon person, every Amazon merchant, because you're probably only going to buy like one or two things from them. So it's not feasible to make payment channels with every single person you meet. But what if we had the idea where we can somehow create a network of these payment channels. So if you're connected through some number of edges to any other person on this payment channel network, you can still send a transaction across the network trustlessly, so you don't have to trust anyone. So we kind of, I have a nice little graphic. Like suppose I'm Alice and I want to send money to Charlie and these, these like uh, gray edges are all payment channels. Basically, the Lightning Network is is a network of payment channels. So, like Bob is maybe connected to Alice and uh, David or something. All these these nodes, uh, but Bob is also not even connected to Charlie. So, you know, you only have a payment channel open with someone you're like directly connected with. But it turns out, with like a few slight additions to the HTLC construction, you can actually trustlessly send money through these payment channels across the entire network. <coughs> and so, you know, the question is, can we do this securely? Um, in this paper, the Bitcoin Lightning Network, uh, Scalable Off-Chain Instant Payments by Joseph Poon and Thaddeus Druja, uh, they, they show that it's actually possible to do this. 
and so that gives us some really cool uh, gives us some, gives us some really cool like scalability benefits. So, for example, you know, if we assume there's enough like capital uh, invested in like payment channels in this network, and we assume that you know you're connected to like the person you want to pay with, you can basically make like an unlimited number of transactions between the two, and those transactions never actually have to touch the Bitcoin blockchain. It's only when someone like any two of the parties want to settle that that like transaction balance is updated on the network on the on the Bitcoin blockchain network. So what it means is we can get like orders of magnitude increase in scalability while still retaining the security and you know, trustlessness of the Bitcoin blockchain. So you know, instead of like three TPS or you know six TPS, where what you would get with like a block size increase, you can now get like thousands of TPS or tens of thousands of TPS. And one other like interesting thing or useful thing for the average like paying consumer is that the transaction fees is presumably going to be much much lower because making Lightning Network tra transactions is much cheaper. And you know, if you look at the Bitcoin blockchain as of like today or something, uh, you're going to pay on average like 20 cents in uh, transaction fees, which is not exactly cheap. In fact, uh, one particular use case uh, called micropayments, where say you like basically pay money for every like second of YouTube video you watch, so you know you're not going to pay like you know uh, a millionth of a cent, like. On a Bitcoin blockchain, because you're already, you're paying like a 20 cent transaction fee, that doesn't make any sense. Instead, with like the Lightning Network, you can send like millions of these like tiny, tiny, tiny uh, like transactions that are just updating your balances, but only ever like settle the actual final amount when you like finish watching the video or like every month or something. So, you know, everything's not always perfect. There are some issues with the Lightning, Lightning Network. Um, the first issue is that nodes tend to keep, like, at least like if we look into the future, nodes need to keep a lot of capital locked up in these payment channels. Um, they could charge for like fees for making transactions through them, um, but it's questionable whether that would make up for the like uh, marginal cost of holding so much capital in a payment channel. Uh, and this means there's a strong centralization force where really only nodes with like significant amounts of capital can afford to keep payment channels open for any like length of time. Um, and so because there's less capital required uh, as less nodes are on the network, we kind of enter like a, a tendency towards a hub and spoke network model where you have like a you know, basically a big bank or something with like a couple million or like a billion dollars locked up in these like payment channels between like a few distributors and you just make transactions like to the bank or something. <coughs> so that's, that kind of, yeah? Is it possible to reach the point where like Lightning Network is the like, no one just like settles transactions anymore and like the blockchain just used like as a thread? Yeah, basically. I mean, if you look at the next slide, or I think I might have missed it. But basically, like, in this kind of payment system, you're not even really using the blockchain network as, like, a transaction uh, system. You're basically just using the blockchain as, like, an arbiter. So, you know, you only ever interact with the blockchain when you want to, like, create a payment channel. Uh, but once you've created that payment channel, like, you know, you can basically, like, go off and make a bunch of shit ton of payments, like, between people. But on only ever if someone tries to cheat you, can you go to the blockchain and say, yo, they're cheating me, let me like take all their money. So, uh, and the blockchain like kind of enforces that. And you get to rely on all like, the mining power and whatever. Uh, if, that, if too many transactions start going off the blockchain, wouldn't uh, miners of the main Bitcoin blockchain have less incentive to mine as transaction fees go lower, and they'll stop mining, which would destroy the security of this entire system? Yeah, it's a good point. Um, I mean, there's always going to have to be like people creating new payment channels. Um, 
it's basically anyone's guess as to how often that would be, or you know, how many times people would try to cheat. Uh, it's also conceivable that like as more and more people like go off chain, they might not even like check the blockchain anymore. In which case, you could like submit your cheating transaction, and they might not even notice. You can just like get away with it. But yeah. So that kind of brings us to our summary. Um, so as you can kind of see from this lecture, uh, Bitcoin and other similar blockchains have a scalability issue. That is pretty much objective fact. Uh, the question is, how do we solve this? Um, or maybe even if we want to solve it. Uh, so you know, if we want Bitcoin or whatever to be able to support like global scale transactions, transaction volumes, uh, we need to think of like some solutions. And kind of the ones that we went over here are like block size, capacity increase, segregated witness, side chains, lightning network. Um, but in order to reach that global scale, just like small linear scale like tweaks to like the, the, the transaction volume aren't really gonna help much. Uh, you know, if you remember like Visa's 2000 TPS like on average. Um, so you know, if you remember like block size capacity increase, we get like a small boost, maybe like 2x or 4x. Um, there is however a, a decent centralization risk because you have to deal with longer block propagation times, more frequent orphan rates, um, and also just like, you know, you're gonna start ending up with more and more transactions in the blockchain at a quicker rate, so it becomes more expensive to run a server, so less people run servers. And you know, you can kind of see where that goes. Uh, there's also SegWit, which is, you know, uh, somewhat, it gives you a decent boost. Like, it's a basically a one-time, like, 1.8x uh, scalability boost. Um, dude, there's some issues, though, with, like, its complexity. Uh, but, you know, whatever. It does, however, SegWit is actually necessary for Lightning Network to happen. Or at least the transaction malleability fixes are. Um, there's also side chains, which are uh, an interesting idea. Um, basically, you can like have pegged uh, other like blockchains that are pegged to the Bitcoin blockchain, and they can do like their own fancy you know scaling algorithms and stuff. Uh, and then there's obviously the Lightning Network, which in, in my opinion is probably the most or the uh, technology with the greatest potential to bring you know something like Bitcoin to global scale uh, transaction volume. But it does require kind of a significant restructuring of our, our payment system. Um, so it supports like the typical, you know, I pay Alice, your Alice pays Bob like two Bitcoin, you know, that's simple. Uh, but basically anything more complicated like using, you know, Bitcoin scripting system for like contracts or M of N like multi-signatures or N of N multi-signatures um, are so far like not known to work on Lightning, Lightning Network, or at least that's like um, open like research question, so if you're interested, extra credit. Uh, and there's also the centralization <coughs> risk due to like capital uh, prereqs. Um, so yeah, that's the end of the lecture. Uh, for next time, we're gonna be talking about advanced topics. Uh, I don't think we've quite figured out what we're gonna do, but. Uh, on the attendance thing, there's a like thing like, what do you want to know about? Like, talk about your advanced topics. Yeah, don't forget to spill out the attendance because uh, it's kind of dark. But uh, required readings, I think uh, we're going to cover, or we're going to look at private payment channels. There's a uh, new paper called Bolt, which uh, works on top of Zcash, which basically gives you like fully anonymous payment channels, which is pretty cool. Uh, there's decentralized lie detector. I think it's talking about Augur. There's like a uh, distributed prediction market. So you could have probably made a lot of money on Augur if you were like betting on Trump. I had a friend who made five million dollars. Yeah, or if you're like trading, you know, short futures on the stock market. Yeah. Also that. <laughs> um, optional reading, Lightning Network onion routing, which is like anonymization <coughs> for Lightning Network, and confidential values, which is uh, anonymous transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain. So, thanks.